I'm going to make some statements, and I want you to think about these statements regarding yourself. Okay? I am a Christian. I believe I live like a Christian should live. I believe my life has a Christian purpose. I believe I provide for my family the way a Christian should provide for his family. I believe I love my wife the way a Christian should love his wife. I believe my children are raised as a Christian would raise his children. I believe my friends are friends that a Christian would have. I believe I worship God like a Christian should worship God. So what does this mean to you? I guess it's supposed, it would suppose on what is the definition of a Christian. What is your definition of a Christian? Because if you say you're a Christian, then it's going to shape your life. And it's going to shape a whole lot more than this short list that I just read to you. So if you are a Christian, do you believe in what 2 Timothy 3.16 says, that all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness? So that's one of the first things that as a Christian, if you say you're a Christian, is that you believe everything that the scripture says. That you believe that everything that's in between the, these two covers is breathed out by God. You also believe that John 1, 1, it says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So people don't, they kind of struggle with that, with that verse because it, we just, I don't know, sometimes our minds, you know, being... Uh, the way we think about things, we don't quite understand that. But what it's saying is, is that everything that's in this book is God. So if you want to know about God, if you want to know what God thinks about something that you're concerned with, then this is where you need to look. You also believe that in Hebrews 4.12, it says, The word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So some people look at this book strictly as a history book. That this is something that took place 2,000 years ago and beyond and that it's just a historical document. God says, if you believe that the scripture is breathed out by God, and you, breathe, you believe that it's living and active, then it says that it's living and active, that it's sharper than any two-edged sword, that this word that we read today, it, it affects our lives, it has full meaning today. It has full meaning in our life today, and that it, it can actually... Um, it says it's a double-edged sword. So what does that mean? It, I mean, think about a double-edged sword, okay? Uh, most knives have a blade, a sharp edge only on one side. So it can only do its work one way. It can only injure somebody on that sharp edge. You can't, the back side of it is dull. It's flat. He says that his word is sharper than any two-edged sword. So we have to be very careful how we use it. We have to understand when we read it that we can expect there to be some pain there. We can expect that when we read God's word that not all the time is it going to be, you know, peaches and cream. It's going to be wonderful. Because there's a lot of so-called Christian faiths out there that when you go to their worship, that's all you hear is the good stuff. You don't hear about the sin that's in our life and, and why, why we are sinning. You know, we don't want to hear that. We don't want to hear the bad things. But we need to trust and believe that what God says is that it is a double-edged sword. It says that it can pierce deep into your soul, that it, it's discerning the thoughts and intentions of your heart. 
Because I know, I know people that speak and say things that a Christian would say. But when you look at their life and the, everything that goes on in their life, what comes out of their heart is contrary to that. If you're a Christian, you also believe John 1, 14, it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That God, because we already said that the, God, the Word and God is one and the same. It says the Word became flesh. That Jesus is the same. That if you want to know anything about God, that you can read the Scripture and, and look at the life of Jesus Christ and the, the way He dealt with people, the decisions that He made. And those are the same decisions and, and, uh, and things that, that God would make because they're one and the same. You also believe that Colossians 1.15, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Again, that everything that you want to know about God, you can find out from Jesus. And that's why he sent him here. He wanted people to see the type of being that he is and the, and the love that he has for all of us he did that through Christ that just as God spoke the word the world and everything in it to an existence that just as God spoke to Adam and told him exactly how uh, he and Eve should live that God speaks to, to me he speaks to us through his word telling us how we should live and have a life with him in it. We cannot have a relationship with God without his word. We cannot learn how to live with God in our lives by any other means. You know, there's a lot of books out there that, uh, you know, we, we, we might use to teach a Bible class that are, you know, these books are written by men. Uh, a lot of them are written by godly men. And we can learn from those books. But what's, what's dangerous is that when we start to take and put those books above the Scripture, that when we start to base our worship, um, our prayers, are, are based off of books that are written by godly men, okay, but it's not the Scripture. So we need to make sure that and, and, you know, I read those books. I have them. You know, I, I, I don't do a lot of reading, but I do have those books. Um, but when it comes time for me to make a decision about something, um, especially if it's something extremely important that's related to the church or uh, brothers and sisters are having problems, this is where I want to go. This is where I want to go. If I want to know that am I living my life as a Christian, then I should be able to see it in, the, in his word. In Micah 6, 8, it says, He has told you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with your God. James 1, 27 says, Religion that is pure and undefiled before God is the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. God makes it very clear if we want to look for it. Are you willing to take the, chance, the, the courage that it takes to look at his word and say, I accept this as his truth, his word. And this is how I should live my life. That when I'm having a relationship problem, this is how I should deal with it. That when I'm having struggles within the church with my own brothers and sisters, this is how I should handle it. That when I'm having trouble with my children, this is why I'm having it. Is there a reason why these problems are coming up? Is it because I've, I've lacked to do something as a parent? Those answers are in the scripture. The problem with it is that most people, when they read it, 
They don't want to accept it. They, they, they read it and say that it's okay, I'm, it's God's word, but you know, but that was, that was 2,000 years ago. That doesn't apply now. Things are different now. Things are different now. Things are not different now. People are people, you know. We're still the same selfish, sinful people that they were 10, 2,000 years ago. If I want to know if my life as a Christian has a purpose, a Christian purpose, because, I mean, that's a common question that people, I hear people ask, is that I want to know what God's will is for. What am I supposed to be doing? You know, now that I'm a Christian, what am I supposed to be doing? Exodus 9, 16 says, and this is God through, through Moses to Pharaoh. He says, but for this purpose, I have raised you up. For what? For what reason? I've raised you up to show you what? To show you my power so that my name will be proclaimed in all the earth. Mark 16, 15 and 16 says, and he said to them, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Whoever does not believe will be condemned. Philippians 2, 12 and 13 says, Therefore, my beloved, just as, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. The last one is Philippians 2, 14 through 16 says, Do all things, this is a great one for us, right? Do all things without grumbling or disputing. <coughs> That's something we could all learn from. Do all things without grumbling or disputing that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Our life, multiple places from the scripture here, and there's plenty, plenty more, but our life has to be centered around enlightening people to the presence of God, the presence of Jesus, what he did for us. It doesn't mean that I'm going to go to work with my Bible open and, and recite scripture all day while I'm walking up and down the hallway. Because no one would have, any, want, have anything to do with me. But what he says is that as, and this is a great phrase. Let me go back and read this. If I can find it. So he says, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. He says that you should live your life blameless and innocent. He says, in the midst of a crooked generation. So it doesn't mean that you should isolate yourself and live in a bubble. He says that you should live. How, how are other people going to know what, it, what good it is to be a Christian? How great it is to be a Christian? That we're, we're fun people. We're fun to be around. How are people going to know that if you don't live and work in the midst of that? So we do have to make choices in the work that we do. You know, uh, I had somebody recently said that they left their position at a company, they left their job because they were immoral and, and, and like an ungodly company. And later on, I'm sure now we're talking, and I said, you know, I, I don't know if I know a company that's, that's not that. I mean, that's just the way, because they're worldly companies. I mean, what's the number one reason 
for starting a company. I don't care if it's two people or a, you know, 500 people corporation. It's to make money. That's what, that's what the, the sole purpose of a company is to make money. So therein lies a the problem to start with. If I want to provide for my family, if I'm a Christian and I want to provide for my family, then 1 Thessalonians 4, 9-12 tells me that, Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to, write to you, for, your, uh, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another, for that indeed it is what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more and to aspire to live quietly, to mind your own affairs, and to work with you hand, your hands as we instructed you, so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. So he wants, God says that he wants his people to live a quiet life. You know anybody that's like always up in everybody's business? We are, everybody knows somebody like that. Everybody knows. He says, don't, don't worry about your own affairs. Keep, your, keep yourself unstained, as he says before, unstained from the world. And look, are we going to be perfect at that? The, I'm not, I'm not going to stand here and tell you that I do that, 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 that that's my life. I'm a model Christian. Because we're not. That's, and that's what frustrates people who are not Christians is that they feel like a lot of us are hypocrites. Okay? You're not a hypocrite if you believe that you are a sinner and you're, there's, there's going to be sin in your life no matter what you do. How hard you try, there's going to be. You can, and, and that's what he's saying. He's telling you this is the perfect way to live. He's not saying that if you live this way that you know that you that you can do it 100% of the time he's also not saying that this is how you should tell other people how to live and i think that's a big mistake that we make is that we should we are going to show people god we are going to show people a christian life by how we live not by telling them how they should live does that make sense? You know, there are times that people, you know, that, that I've, I've come across that um, they, are, they are really shut down to, to where they, they just don't want to talk about Christianity at all. They, they don't want to hear anything about it. And it's because of that, uh, that mindset that, that we're hypocrites. And you know what? God didn't do that. We did that to ourselves. We did that to ourselves. He says, aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs and to work with your hands as we instructed you. Now, does that mean that we all have to have uh, jobs where we do things with our hands? Okay. Um, I believe that, you know, I, right now I have an office job. I used to work with my hands, now I have an office job. If you look at the whole context of this passage, what he's saying is, is that just live a humble life. You know, I mean, they're, they're, believe me, these companies that we just talked about would benefit by having a Christian as a CEO. Because we know that, that in that high position, that if it doesn't go to his head, if that sin doesn't creep in, right, and the money doesn't get a hold of him, that they can do great good for God by being in that position of high authority. <clears throat> if I'm a Christian, if I say that I'm raising my children in the way a Christian man or woman should, live, should raise their, their children, Ephesians 6, 4 says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. 
Now the next, let me read the next one because this is the one that men love to, to quote. They can't really memorize anything else, but they'll memorize this one because it says, whoever spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. So that's, that's a lot of men use that quote. I actually know a guy that, that had a rod that he disciplined his kids with, a rod, okay? Um, but the thing is, is that they don't want to read the one from Ephesians, right? That says, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. How do you, how do you do that? How do you discipline your children, but do not provoke them to anger? A part of it is that you need to include your children from a, even from a very young age in the scripture. There are things that they can learn from that. Don't you know? Don't pick uh, you know the roles of women in the church or something. Don't don't try to explain that to them. But there's some good things that they can learn about how to live a life. And you know what, children always, always look at the parents. How does the parent react to something? You know, how does the parent treat the spouse? How does the parent, how do they interact with other kids? How do they interact in the, what are they doing in the church? You know, all those kind of things. What kind of job do they have? How do they, are they, you know, how do they um, act at work? You know, are, is a child always hearing about all kind of horrible things that happened at work and that they got in trouble and you know this guy you know this this supervisor treats me bad and all that is that what they're hearing all the time or are they hearing good positive things or are they hearing about maybe there is a problem but this is how they're they're dealing they're dealing with it the way god would have to deal with it if i have christian friends Matthew 12, 46 through 50 says, While he was still speaking to the people, behold, his mother and his brother stood outside asking to speak to him. But he replied, this is Jesus talking, but he replied to the man who told him, Who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his, his hand toward his disciples, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whosoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Luke 9, 57 through 62 says, As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. And yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Those are some pretty tough words. And that, like I said, you know, if, if you, there are people that will read the scripture and they'll read those passages. And because they love their family so much, because they have, they have friends that they've been friends with since they were two years old, whatever. They have friends at work that none of these people are Christians. He says that who, who are your, who are your, who's your mother? Who's your brother? Okay, who's your father? He says, these are my disciples. These, this is my family. This, you are my family. You are my family. Now, does that mean that you don't associate with those people? Well, how are those people going to be part of this family if you don't associate with them? Now, if they're involved in things that or illegal, or you know what I'm saying. I mean, if they're involved in those kind of things, they shouldn't be your friend anyway. But for like your family, I mean, that look, that that is like the toughest nut to crack, so to speak. I mean, I, I don't have anybody in my family 
or Sharon's family for that matter, that believes the way we believe. So does that mean we don't associate it with them? No. Some not, but most of them. We, we still associate with them. But how are they going to know Christ if we don't treat, you know, they need to be part of this family too. But we have to show them by our life, the decisions that we make in our life, how we treat people, when things when things go bad in the family where they bring the family together, whether it be some tragedy, death, it could be something good, it could be a wedding, right? Where the family comes together. They need to see how our life, they need to see how your life has changed you for the better. <clears throat> if I worship God, like a Christian should worship. John 4, 23 through 24 says, But the hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. There's too many quote-unquote Christian faiths that base their whole worship service on emotion. They want you to feel good. They want you to have a good time. And they, they project that this is the Spirit of God is here doing, that that's the Spirit of God working in you that because you hear the music or whatever it is that's happening, that that is what's important and that's the Spirit of God working. That's not what God says. Remember now, being a what is being a Christian all about? Yes, we, we are saved from our sins by Jesus Christ. But the, the whole point, and I think even good, true Christians, if you want to call them that, miss this point. The whole point of being a Christian, having your sins forgiven, is that you can restore the relation and have a relationship with God. You. Not just as a church, but you personally can start to have a relationship with God. And that's what our worship should be. Even though we come here together as a church and we worship together, it should be going on inside of you. You should be thinking about and meditating on and, and listening to your heart and say, where's my heart at today? Where's my relationship with God? How, what can I do to change? Listen to what the preacher says. Listen to the prayers that are being said. How is that? What can I use out of that to better my relationship with God? Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 7 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up, when you rise up. You shall love the God, Lord God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. Do we do that every day? No. We are still drug away by the, what's going on around us. The world is going at 100 miles an hour. But think about that. And if you're going to meditate on something today, think about that. That love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your strength. And he says, you shall teach them diligently to your children. I mean, think about all the things I talked about this morning. Doesn't this kind of cover everything? Teach them to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your, in your house. You shall talk when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. All day long, you know, Christianity is not something that you just flip on and off like a light switch. There's a lot of folks that do that. They flip it on when they walk in here on Sunday. When they walk out the door, they flip it off. They come to a Bible study on Wednesday night, they flip it back on again. 
Now, sometimes during the week, 